miserable. And after the doctors gave up on her, they, uh, she told her mother, she says, I just want to go to Colorado and have some fun. She'd been sick for seven years or something. And they just happened to choose Woodland Park, Colorado. <laughs> and they checked into a bed and breakfast and the woman noticed that Marin was in a wheelchair and asked her what had happened and she told her and she says, well, they have a healing school, right? Just less than a mile from here. I think you ought to go. And they had never heard of me. They didn't know anything about why they were here and they just came to healing school and Greg Moore was teaching that day. Greg will be teaching during this uh, Healing is Here conference and Greg just got up and said something as simple as God wants you well. Yeah. And they had never heard that. They'd been taught that God is the one that puts sickness on us to teach us something, that this is God's way of breaking you, that God is sovereign. And just to hear simple things that you've heard so much truth already today, it's powerful. And anyway, Marion came and received prayer and nothing happened at that exact moment. But within a week or two, she was able to stand like what Carly was talking about. And then within another week or two, I think it was one month from that healing school, she just stood up and started walking. And today she is just as healthy as she can possibly be. And I tell you, God wanted her well. God wants you well. God wants all of us well. And it's just our stinking thinking that gets in the way. And so this is what we're holding this conference for is just to help realign our thinking so that God can do what he wants to do. God wants you well more than you want to be well. We just have to cooperate with him. It's awesome. I know that uh, I saw that uh, Daniel asked right at the end of the first session, how many of you are from another country? But I'd like to see that. How many of you are from another country? Wow. That's awesome. I've already talked to people that are from Canada. Who's from Canada? If you're from Canada, stand up. Wow, look at this. Praise the Lord. Thank you. How many of you are from Germany? I talked to people from Germany. Right here. Anybody else? Praise God. And where else? Austria, I heard. Anybody from Austria? Stand up. From where? Switzerland? Switzerland and Austria. Amen. Praise God. Oh, somebody's got their flag over here. Where is that? Australia? Amen. Stand up if you're from Australia. Praise the Lord. Awesome. Caribbean? Dominica. Dominica from the Caribbean. Praise the Lord. Where are you from? Portugal? I've been there. That's a great place. Where are you from? Mexico. Mexico. Praise the Lord. Where else? Hong Kong. Praise the Lord. Are you a part of our school in Hong Kong? Oh, great. Awesome. Praise the Lord. Where else? Malaysia. Praise the Lord. Man, that's awesome. Where else? South Africa. Praise the Lord. Yes, sir. Cameroon. Praise the Lord. Where else? Where? India. India. Praise the Lord. Man, isn't this great? Where else? Taiwan. 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 Praise God. Did we miss anybody? Back here, up here in the balcony. In the balcony, where are you from? Singapore. Praise the Lord. And where else? Where? Trinidad, Trinidad Tobago, yes. Where? 
Venezuela. Praise God. Costa Rica. Man, this is amazing. Yes. Where? All right, I heard Nigeria. Where are you from? And where were you from? Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan. Praise the Lord. Man. That's amazing. Yeah, way over here. Where? Cayman Islands. Is that right? Praise the Lord. Man, that's amazing. Jamaica? Praise the Lord. And you're the one that brought your baby close. Believe in God for a healing. Amen. Man, that is tremendous. Hungary. Praise the Lord. Are y'all just calling out names or are you really from all of I tell you what, that is tremendous. Maine? Well, that could be considered a different country, but praise the Lord. I tell you what, I believe God's up to something. God brought people here from all over the world. Praise God. You know, Daniel and Carly made mention of this earlier, but she, Carly especially was saying that we just don't know who we are. And we don't know sometimes what God is doing until way after the fact. But to think that God brought people from all of these different countries that we've probably already seen a thousand healings. This is phenomenal. This is a work of God. I'm just so thrilled. I'm so blessed. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, what I'm going to start sharing on, I've got a brand new teaching coming out. It'll be about a month from now. Our book will be out on the power of imagination. And I'm going to talk about the power of imagination to affect your healing. And many people don't understand this. Daniel and Carly have danced all around this and talked about it all this morning. So uh, they gave you the tease. I'm going to start teaching on this and I'm going to teach tonight also. And we will be explaining it a little bit more. Let me start with a story that many of you, if you've heard me teach on this, you might have heard this before, but it's just really classic and it makes the point. And then I'm going to explain what happened. But I was listening to a tape one time and there was a woman who was legally blind, had really thick glasses, and she had been prayed for many, many times. And exactly what Daniel and Carly were talking about this morning about Getting sickness in your body is one thing, but when it gets on the inside of you, in your heart and in your mind, that's when it's hard to get people healed. And this woman had been sick for so long and had poor eyesight for so long that that's the way she saw herself. And she just couldn't stand to be disappointed one more time. So they had a healing minister coming to her church, but she didn't want to receive prayer because she didn't want to be disappointed again. And so she avoided this healing minister. And anyway, he just uh, finally trapped her on the last night of the meeting. And he says, I want to pray for you. So she said, okay. And he made her take her glasses off. And then he prayed for her. And he says, now, can you see? So she started to open her eyes. And he says, shut your eyes. And so she shut her eyes thinking, well, how can I tell if I can see <laughs> if I can't open my eyes? And so he says the second time, now, can you see? And so she started to open her eyes and he said, shut your eyes. And she shut her eyes, confused. And finally, he said the third time, now can you see? So she started to open her eyes and he said, I didn't tell you to open your eyes. You have to see yourself seeing on the inside before you see yourself seeing with your eyes. And so she finally understood what he was talking about and she just kept her eyes closed and prayed in tongues for a while. And after a while, she says, I can see it. I can see myself seeing. And he says, now open your eyes. And he, she opened her eyes and she could see perfectly. Man, that was awesome. And I tell you, this, 
Uh, Daniel and Carly have already talked about this, but I'm going to go into some more detail on it. But this is one of the big problems of people receiving healing is because they have an image on the inside. They see themselves sick. They think sick. They talk sick. They dream sick. And then they wonder why they aren't seeing the healing. Proverbs 23, 7 says, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. You have a self-fulfilling prophecy on the inside. You see yourself a certain way. And this isn't limited to healing. This, is, this is, applies to every area of your life. It's like your imagination is a governor that uh, just stops you. Once you begin to start going beyond what you see yourself doing, it just stops you dead in your tracks. You can't go beyond it. As you think in your heart, that's the way that you are. And the sad fact is many of us see ourselves sick. We see ourselves infirm. You see yourself getting older and you're thinking, what is, man, it's already a problem now. What's this going to be like as I get older? And you see all of these things. And that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I want to start over in Psalms 103 and in verse 14. And I'm going to share some things with you on imagination. And um, there's a lot of negative things associated with imagination. Most Christians believe that an imagination is only uh, fantasy. And uh, that certainly is not what I'm talking about. We're talking about the real deal. But look here in Psalms 103. It's a great passage. Matter of fact, uh, Daniel has already quoted this once this morning. But let's read in verse uh, 12. It says, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children... So the Lord pitieth them that fear him. They've already talked about this, that what kind of parent would want their child to be sick if they had the power to heal? What kind of parent would want their child to be sick? It'd be considered child abuse. This is saying that in the same way, God loves you so much. God wants you well. He pities us. And then look at this in verse 14. For he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. You know, a frame is like a skeleton on a person's body. This building has a frame to it. We had to put up the walls and then do all of these things. There is a frame. It's what holds everything else up. And did you know that the word that was translated frame right here is the Hebrew word Y-E-T-S-E-R and it literally means conception. And this word was translated imagination five times in the Old Testament. One of the clearest is Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 where it says that the Lord came down and saw that the imagination of men's thoughts were only evil continually. That's the exact same word. And did you know that this exact same word, Y-E-T-S-E-R, was also translated mind over in Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3 where it says the Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him. This is the exact same word. So it was translated frame because your imagination, your mind is what holds you up. It's, you can't do anything without it. It is your spiritual womb. You know, Carly was prophesying about people being healed of that. And we have a womb, a spiritual womb. This is what it says. The definition of that Hebrew word, yet sir, is conception is what it means. This is where you conceive things. Did you know I built this building? I actually drew this building out on a, on a napkin. And that building over there, I drew it out on a napkin and I told the uh, architects what I was doing. And so they started drawing something that looked a lot better than what I did. <laughs> and then I'd look at it and I'd say, nope, that's not what I want. And we kept drawing and talking until they saw what I saw. I saw this building. And I wish I had time to go into all of this. If you haven't been on our website and seen the testimony that we call the Little Star video, it's a, a man, Gilbert Jackson, owned this property. And 11 days before he died, he got born again. His hospice worker led him to the Lord and he got born again. And, and the next morning he woke up and he felt so badly that he had never given any time to the Lord 
that he uh, dedicated this property right here to Christian education and God showed him a vision of these buildings with glass on them and he saw this and 11 days before he died, he dedicated this property to the Lord. That was in 1992. And on that exact day, I was in England and God spoke to me about starting a Bible school, June the 22nd, 1993. And so at the exact day that he had this vision, I was in England and God spoke to me and I came back and I built these buildings without knowing his vision. God put this vision in my heart. God showed me these buildings. And I've got a bunch more buildings. I've got $150 million worth of buildings that I've seen. But I saw these buildings. And you know what? I kept talking to the architects and they would draw pictures and then they'd come back and I'd say, no, change it. And I eventually uh, got them to see what I was seeing. And this is what framed all of this. You can't do anything without an imagination. Again, I just want to emphasize this briefly because a lot of people, when you think of imagination, they, they equate it with fantasy. They equate it with, I think, again, Daniel was talking about the magic kingdom and that's what people think of as imagination. But you have to use your, did you know you, wherever you parked, praise God, we just got our TCO for the parking garage yesterday, amen. <laughs> And so if you're parked in our parking garage, did you know you have a picture of where your car is? You do. I was walking out yesterday with somebody, or not yesterday, it was a couple of days ago, and I was walking out and somebody was, uh, we were going to walk to their car and they started to walk out and they stopped for just a second and they had to think, now where's my car? And they remembered that it was to the right and so they started and then they started looking. Did you know they had a picture of where that car was. That's your imagination. If you didn't have an imagination, you couldn't find your car today. Did you know you couldn't go home? You'd have to use the GPS to get home every time if you didn't have an imagination, but you've done it. Did you know that every one of you, probably most of you have never sat down and counted the windows in your house? But I could ask you, how many windows do you have in your house? And you don't have it just stored in your information. But did you know you could tell me? You could count them because you can see your house. And some of you, if you have a big house, you might have a lot of windows and it might, but let's just say take one room, you know, your bedroom or something. How many windows are in your bedroom? Or I could ask you, what was your house that you grew up in? Now, if you traveled all of the time and didn't have just one house, it may be vague because you uh, lived in so many different places. But uh, if you lived in one place, I, like right now, you could ask me what the house was like that I grew up in and I could draw the floor plan for you. I've, I've got a picture of it. I know exactly what it looks like. And yet I'm not looking at it. The definition of imagination, according to the dictionary, is just your ability to picture something in your mind or in your heart that you can't see with your eyes. Right now, if I was to ask you, or, or I've was to try and give you directions, how you go down here to Walmart. I could tell you that you exit this property and when you get to the uh, end of our property, you turn right, you go out the highway 24, there's a stop sign there and then you turn left and I could count. I've never done this, but I could count and tell you exactly how many stoplights or green lights, as Daniel was talking about, <laughs> I could tell you how many lights there are before you get down to Walmart. I could tell you it's on the right side. I could tell you what's around Walmart. I could do all these things, and yet I don't know those things. I've never sat down and memorized it, but I've got a picture of it. You think in pictures. Whether you realize it or not, this is your frame. It's how God made us. God knows our frame, and that word is literally imagination. This is how he created you. You can't do anything without an imagination. Matter of fact, in the 11th chapter of Genesis, let me just read this to you quickly, but in Genesis chapter 11 is where the people were building the Tower of Babel after the flood. And the Lord came down to see this building that they were making. And in Genesis chapter 11, verse 6, it says, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing 
will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. He says, if you can imagine it, you can do it. And this was, the imagination is so powerful that it actually threatened God's plans for the human race. And so he had to do something to divide their ability to communicate and, and share the picture that they had on the inside with another person. Like I was talking about building this building, I began to talk, talk to our architects and I had to tell them things. I used words. You know, if, you were, if you're assembling something, they will have written instructions and they'll say A goes to B or whatever, but then they'll have a figure over there, a picture that helps you to see it. A picture is worth a thousand words. And if I wasn't able to speak to these builders and draw little crude things and then they talk back and they draw their drawings and if we hadn't been able to communicate we wouldn't have come we wouldn't have been able to build these buildings and so the Lord confused their languages and gave different languages to stop our ability from communicating and, and merging these imaginations together you know, I'm not going to take the time to go into the explanation, but this morning I had a dream that was one of the strangest dreams I've ever had. And anyway, I hadn't got time to go through it, but uh, it was about something that at this moment is completely impossible. It cannot happen. And yet I dreamed that it happened and I was telling Jamie about it and I said, you know what? I've imagined it. I believe that that could be done. Amen. And within a short period of time, I was coming up with ways to do something that no human being has ever done in there. And I believe if you can imagine it, you can do it. Amen. And the sad fact is most of us, when we're young, you have a vivid imagination and then it's beat out of you and you're actually told to quit dreaming, to quit thinking big. Matter of fact, we've got uh, Roland, I forget his last name, but... Uh, Deutschman, but he's the head of schools that has a branch here in Woodland Park and he comes and, and he says that he asked all of the fifth, uh, the five-year-olds, the kindergarten kids when they first come in, how many of you are artists? Every single one raises their hand. How many of you can sing? Every single one raise their hand. How many of you can do? Everybody raises their hand. Then he asked them when they're in high school, how many of you are artists? And there'll be two, three image on the inside begins to change and the sad fact is most people become pessimists, uh, critical, cynical the older they get because of life has just beat this out of them and you can describe that in a lot of different ways but a biblical way of talking about it is your imagination has been affected. You no longer see yourself capable of doing all of these things. Man this is huge what I'm saying. And applying it to healing, many of us have just been taught that, you know, at certain times of the year, it's flu season. It's what you do. You just get sick. It's normal. We've been taught that to have a cold once a year is just normal. And that you got to be sick every once in a while. And that you got to have pains. And I'm getting older. And so therefore I can't expect to be pain free. And you know what? You, you expect your joints to start getting uh, to where they ache and things like this. And we have been taught this. And that is the image that you have. And it is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Your imagination is so powerful that the collective imagination of mankind actually challenged God's purposes and that's the reason that he divided our languages. I tell you, your imagination is one of the most powerful things. It is your spiritual womb. It's where you conceive things. You know, you can't have a child without conception. If you're praying for a child just for God to send it, you know, by the stork. You're just believing God for a child. It's not going to work that way. You have to conceive a child. And this word, Y-E-T-S-E-R, that was translated mind and imagination, it literally means conception. This is how you conceive things. And when it comes to healing, one of the things that we really try and do at this conference 
is to teach you how to conceive and give birth to your own healing instead of having you come and just have us wave our hands over you. Now, we are praying with people and Carly made a point of that. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong. We all need help at times, so there's nothing wrong with you getting help. But you know what? We only have this Healing is Here conference once a year. What happens if you get struck in September or October and only have two months to live and you don't have time to come to another healing conference? Man, we want you to learn how to receive. And this is one of the things that's different about this conference is it's not just trying to have the anointing of God fall and to get something to happen. We're trying to teach you what you already have. You already have the same power on the inside of you that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18 and 19 says that he's praying that your eyes would be open so that you can see what you have in verse 19, that you have the same power that raised Christ from the dead. It's not out there. You don't have to pray it down. This is where so many weird doctrines come from, that the demons are blocking our prayers from getting up to heaven. Our prayers didn't get above the ceiling. You don't need your prayer to get above your nose because God's right here, amen. <laughs> this is the reason you bow your head when you pray so you can look at God. God's here. You got the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead living on the inside of you. And what we're trying to do is to help you to release what you have instead of telling you to come and get what I've got. You've already got the fullness of God. And uh, tonight, I'm, we're going to be giving an invitation for anybody who isn't born again, anybody who doesn't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you've got those two things, if you are born again and baptized in the Holy Spirit, you've got everything that it takes to see the blind eyes open, the deaf ears open, to walk free, to come out of wheelchairs, to be 100% free. But you're going to have to keep your eyes closed until you can see yourself well. And the problem is that we just pray. And then Daniel was talking about this. We ask our body, am I healed? You're walking by, by sight instead of by faith. The scripture says, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, that we walk by faith and not by sight. And yet the average Christian is walk, walking by sight and not by faith. You've got to get to where you see yourself healed, to where you see it. And it becomes a part of you. Look at this passage over in 1 Chronicles chapter 28. And in verse 9, this is uh, David praying for Solomon. David was dying, and this is some of the last words that he spoke. First Chronicles 28, 9, And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. So notice it says that he understandeth all of the imagination of the thoughts. Did you know that this, your imagination is a part of your thought process? And whether you know it or not, you think in pictures. Yes. Most of you haven't sat down and, and thought about this, but you think in pictures. I've used a lot of these things, so if you've heard it before, forgive me, but I'm just going to, you know, there's people that come here that have never heard these things, and man, we need to, to know all of this. But if I say dog, you don't see the words or the letters D-O-G, you see a dog. If I said dog, you think of a dog. If I say apple, you think of an apple. If, if I say a banana, you, you picture a banana. You don't see the word spelled out. There are some of you that can't spell banana. But you can see it. And words paint pictures. If I said, you know, if I say dog, some of you, probably the majority of people are going to picture, a, if you have a dog, that's the dog that you will picture. Or if you have a neighbor with a dog, or if you've had any experience with one, you will picture something that you've experienced, but you have a picture of a dog. And words paint pictures. And so I could say a big dog. And immediately some of you have to change your picture because you got a little dog. 
I could say a big black dog and you have to change your picture because you got a white dog. And I could say a big black mean dog and I could describe a Doberman pincher with its tail bobbed and I can start using all of these words. And you know what? Now everybody's picturing the same thing. But if I tried to, if I was talking about something that you've never seen before and if you couldn't picture it, you can't really grab it. You won't be able to retain it. Did you know your memory? Look at this verse over in chapter 29 and verse 8, 18. This is 1 Chronicles 29, 18. Uh, David here, uh, they took up an offering and they gave the equivalent of billions, billions of dollars worth of gold, silver, precious stones for the building of the temple. Dan, uh, David gave billions of dollars personally out of his own treasury and the people were so touched to see what he had done that they started giving and they gave more than he gave. There was about $4 billion worth of gold, silver, and precious stones that came in in this offering. And Daniel was, I mean, uh, David was so touched by this, he began to start praying and saying, Lord, who are we to give an offering like this. We were slaves in Egypt. We had nothing. And now look at all of this abundance. All we've done is give back a portion of what you've given unto us. Who are we to do this? And then he prayed this in verse 18. He says, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of thy people and prepare their heart unto thee. He says, keep it forever in the thoughts of the imagination of your people. In other words, help them to remember it. Did you know you can't remember without an imagination? If I was to describe something, but if you can't picture it, you can't remember it. Man, what I'm saying is so important. Most people don't think about this stuff and this is why their brains don't work very good. <laughs> Did you know if you're just taught that two plus two is four, four plus four is eight. And if you learn it all by rote and you, you don't have a practical application, you can't see a use for it. Well, then that's the reason that people don't do well with math is because it's abstract. They can't see it. But did you know if you can show a person the use of it, like for instance, every day of my life, I get over a hundred pages of reports every day. And it gives me the number of phone calls that we've got, the amount of money that came in, the amount of product that has been offered and on and on and on it goes. And did you know that every, like if it's the third of the month and I'll take a figure that we've had, I don't know, let's just say 6,000 calls in uh, three days. Well, I know that uh, three days is one tenth of a month. And so I can anticipate that this month we will have, that would mean that we would have 60,000 uh, phone calls. You know what that is? That's math, but that's got a practical application. And if you can see a practical use of it, if you could do it instead of just learning it by memory and something that you've said so many times, if you could see the use of it, all of a sudden math just opens up. Same thing with history. I know many of you weren't answer, asking that question, but that's an answer <laughs> to why some of you just hate math. It's because you can't see a use for it. If you can see it, then you can remember it. Then it becomes alive to you. And this is what a minister, it's what any type of person that communicates is supposed to do. You've got to be able to paint pictures with your words. This is what Jesus did by teaching parables, talking about a man sowing a seed. You know, it's not really talking about farming. It's talking about the kingdom of God and how the word of God works in the kingdom. But it uses something that people see and are familiar with. And if you can see it, then you can retain it. You know, I've used this example and some of you might have heard me use this. And so if you have, well, then you could remember it. But many of you in here won't know what a water blivet is. But you know what? In, the, in Vietnam, we had a water blivet. That we, that's where we got our drinking water from. I was on a fire support base up on a hill and we were cut off, completely surrounded by the NVA and stuff. So they had to bring us in all of our food and all of our water. And water blivets were these black rubber cylinders. And uh, it, was, it was a cylinder and on each end there was a brass spigot and they came in 250 
500, 1,000, and 1,500 gallon sizes. And the, air, the helicopters would uh, hook onto each end where that brass spigot was, and they would fly them in and drop it off. And anyway, you'd go to the spigot and you'd fill up your container with this uh, water that was in there, and the atmospheric pressure would collapse them as they emptied out so that they'd be totally flat and they'd pick them up, carry them off, and get another one. Now, that may not be a perfect picture, but now you could retain what a water believe it is, where if I'd have just said the words, you'd have lost it because you don't have anything to tie it to. You, you don't have a picture associated with it. So I'm saying all of these things to say that that's your imagination. You can't think without an imagination. You can't understand without an imagination. You can't remember without an imagination. Your imagination is the framework and it's the conception. It's the spiritual womb of everything. And this applies to every part of your life, but specifically concerning healing. You have to conceive your miracle. Now again, you can go and adopt somebody else, a miracle from somebody else, <laughs> amen, but all babies come through this process. Now you might be able to go and adopt somebody else's baby. You might be able to come and let somebody down here lay hands on you and get healed through what they're doing. But if you're going to receive personally from the Lord, this is how it works. You have to conceive it and your conception takes place in your imagination. If you can't see yourself healed, then you're going to have to go adopt somebody else's miracle. You know, uh, I didn't completely understand all the things I'm sharing with you right here, but I just knew that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And I was reading one day in John 14, 12, where it says, uh, Jesus was speaking and he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And I was reading that and I said, Father, I really believe this, and yet I haven't seen the works that you've done. Forget the greater works right now. I hadn't seen the works that he had done. I hadn't seen anybody raised from the dead at that time. And I said, I'm a, I'm a believer. And so I should see the dead raised. I should see blind eyes open. I should see deaf ears open. I ought to be able to see people walk that can't walk. And so I took those verses and I just started meditating on them. And I'm going to talk about this more tonight. But meditation is all using your imagination. Whether you realize it or not, you can't meditate without your imagination. And so I began to take these promises of God and just pray over it and say, Father, I'm going to see these things happen. And I focused in on seeing the dead raised. And so what I did was take every instance in the Bible where a person was raised from the dead. There's eight of them outside of Jesus being raised from the dead. And then at his resurrection, it says that a multitude came out of the graves and walked in Jerusalem. And it doesn't give you the specific numbers. But individual cases of people being raised from the dead, there was eight of them starting with uh, Elijah and then Elisha and going right on. So I took those out of the scriptures, put them at this time, it was before I had a computer, I just put them on a legal pad and I wrote these scriptures out and I started reading them and I meditated on them to the point that I had all of the information, all of the details there. You can't meditate on something that you don't already know. So I had to put the facts in me first. And so I just read them and studied them until I had all of the facts down, learned all of the things that I could. But then I started seeing myself. It, was, it wasn't enough to see Jesus, Jesus going and saying, Lazarus, come forth. But I started seeing me do that in my imagination. I would just see it. And I started, I, I would stand there and I'd say, Lazarus, come forth. And he spoke with a loud voice. And I'd see myself being bold and yelling and saying, Lazarus, come forth. I saw Elisha and Elijah raising the boys from the dead. And, and he went in and laid on him and put his mouth on his mouth, his hands on his hands and laid on top of him and his flesh waxed warm. And then he walked in the house and prayed and then he went and laid on him again and he uh, began to, and he got up and he presented him to his mother raised from the dead. I actually went and laid on a bed and imagined a person being here and me laying my hands on it. I started seeing this. 
And I know some of you think, well, that's weird. But I think you're weird. <laughs> not to use your imagination. It's powerful and not to conceive it. I started seeing it. And I didn't just see Elijah and Elisha and Paul and Peter and Jesus raising the dead. I saw me raising the dead. And I got to where I was meditating on it and thinking about it so much that I started dreaming every night about raising people from the dead. I would raise 20 people from the dead every night in my dreams. <laughs> and I'd wake up sometimes and wonder, was that real? Did it really happen? Because I'm a lucid dreamer is what they call it. Man, I dream all of the time. I dream in color. And anyway, I, I, I just started dreaming and seeing all of it. And then guess what? A man died and I saw him raised from the dead. And some people wouldn't associate all of these things that I'm talking about. But I tell you, that time that I spent, it was probably six months, period of time that I spent just meditating and thinking about this and, and seeing myself doing it. That was my conception. And then it happened. And I saw two people raised from the dead. And then I went about 12 years or something like that and uh, didn't see anybody raised from the dead. And one day I was reading John 14, 12. And I said, you know what? I did this once before. I think I'm going to do it again. And I started doing the same thing. This time I put all of the scriptures on my computer and I just meditate on them and think about it. And then I'd see myself raising people from the dead. And then I got to where I was dreaming every night, raising 20 people from the dead. And my own son died on uh, um, February the 4th, or excuse me, March the 4th, 2001, was dead for five hours. And they called me. And because I'd been meditating on this, Jamie and I just spoke our faith. And our son, who was already dead in a morgue, on a slab, stripped naked, in a freezer, with a toe tag on, sat up and started talking. And praise God. He's alive and well today, buying a house tomorrow. And you know what? There is not, there's not a disconnect. Some people, you get up and tell the testimony about, well, I saw this happen and people, well, I want that. Would you pray for me? Well, that's like me telling you that I've got two boys and you say, well, I'd like to have a boy. Would you pray for me? Well, yeah, I'll pray for you. But you know, it's like Carly was saying, there's a little bit more to it than that. <laughs> you need to conceive. You need to give birth. And there's a lot of people that are just coming and wanting us to produce your miracle for you. Right. And we're glad to pray with you. And we, it's an honor to pray with people and we will do it. If the only way for you to receive a miracle was for you to just conceive it and go through all of the steps that we're talking about, then what would happen for the people that are here and you've only got a week to live? Well, then that would just mean that you are destined to die because you don't have time to conceive and bring it to birth and, and raise it. And so because of that, God has given special gifts to the body of Christ. People that have a gift of faith, the gifts of healing, the gift of miracles and things like that. And you can receive a miracle off of one of these supernatural gifts. And that's good. But you know, the drawback to that is that you can't go home. You can't bring that person that's got this anointing home. He's not going to be able to deal with every single thing. It's, it was never intended to be a substitute for you learning the Word of God and learning how to believe and receive. And the problem has been that the body of Christ basically does not understand how to receive from God. And so they just pray out of desperation and ask God, don't know if anything's going to happen. They come to a conference wanting everybody else to pray and to give them their miracle. And again, we're going to pray with you and we're going to help you. But I'm saying that long-term solution, God's best is for each one of you to understand how to conceive and give birth to your own miracle. And that's what this is all about. This is really not a conference on just drawing in the anointing of God. All that being said, we've had such a powerful anointing here today that man, if this doesn't light your fire, your wood's wet. <laughs> so there is an anointing here and we've probably seen just by the hands that I saw maybe a thousand people already that have been healed. And so yes, the presence of the Lord is here and his power is to heal. And so I believe all of that, but we want, what really blesses me is to see you get hold of these truths 
and be able to start living it. Man, that's awesome. That's God's best. And I'm telling you, we've already heard a lot of great things today. And we've still got another three days to go. Man, if you sit here and if you open up and receive, we're going to be sharing with you the things that God has done in our life. And I tell you what, you not only should be healed, but you ought to be a healing machine. You, you become a mobile office for Jesus. Amen. Amen. That as you go back to all of these different countries and all of these different states, man, we could take this, these yeah. truths. It's the truth that sets people free. And we could take these truths back and we could see these healings multiplied thousands and thousands and thousands of times. This is what our heart's desire really is. You know, when I first started in ministry, I used to pray for everything that would move. And I would stay up until three and four o'clock in the morning praying with people. And we saw great miracles happen. Blind eyes open, deaf ears open, people come out of wheelchairs. And I'm convinced that if I was to just draw everybody's attention to me and God has anointed me and blessed me and if I got your faith built up, I could see some of you healed because you would have faith in my faith and I could get some of you healed off of that. But you know what? I'm limited. I can't pray for everybody that's in here. And I've got an expiration date. I'm planning on being around a long time, but I just turned 70. I'm not, I'm, I'm over halfway there. And I have just reached a place, I actually reached this about 20 years ago where I started bringing my Bible college students with me and I have them pray. And I would rather see people healed through somebody I have taught the Word of God than to see them heal through my prayer. I was just rejoicing watching Daniel and Carly up here, man, just preaching the word and stuff because there was a time back 50 years ago when as far as I know, I know there was other people, but it's in my realm of influence. I was the only one that was preaching healing. The first time I ever saw a person healed, I didn't know that there'd been another person healed in 2000 years. I'd never heard of another person being healed. But I was in a Baptist church and we were just studying Mark chapter 16. These signs will follow them that believe. They'll lay hands on the sick. And I told them in the Baptist church, I said, look, I've never seen a person healed. I don't know if it happens today, but it says believers will do this. I'm a believer. If you get sick, don't stay home. Come to church and I'll pray for you. And so one morning, a young girl, Diane Jacoby, I was teaching a high school group. And I was, I think, 19 years old or something. And she came in and she was green. She was so sick. She looked terrible. And I said, Diane, why are you here? <laughs> and she said, you said that if we were sick, we were supposed to come to the church and you were going to lay hands on us. And I said, oh, I did say that, didn't I? <laughs> so I just set her in a chair and we had about 10 or 15 kids and we just said, well, we're going to do what the word says. And so we laid hands on her and prayed, did the best we could. And she started to throw up, had to run out of the room and she left and went home. And I thought, well, that was really great. <laughs> and I didn't know what to do. I, I did the best I knew how. And anyway, we went into the church service and right before it started, I was sitting there and somebody tapped me on the shoulder and it was Diane. By the time she got home, she was totally healed and she got up in front of the Baptist church and told them that God healed her. And that began my persecution because they didn't believe that those things happened. But you know what? I, I didn't. I didn't learn this from someone. It was just the word and I started doing what the word said and I've made a lot of mistakes and I haven't done things right. But man, we've seen millions of people healed. We've seen, I, I've counted up uh, over 50 something people raised from the dead that I personally know about. We have uh, our discipleship evangelism program in Uganda is... Uh, there's over half a million people a week that go through that program. And I've heard personal testimonies of over 12 people raised from the dead through that. 
We have calls come in all the time and, and over the phone, our phone center people raise people from the dead. We've got dozens of examples of that. Amen. And you know how all this got started? In your imagination. I conceived it. And I'm not taking credit any more than a woman who gives birth takes credit. Look what I did. You didn't do it by yourself, amen. <laughs> there was only one virgin birth and you aren't gonna be the second one, amen. <laughs> but you are the receiver. You have to cooperate. I'm not taking credit for it, but I am saying that I have cooperated and we're, we're wanting you to cooperate and recognize that your imagination is your spiritual womb. It's, it's where you conceive things. And so if you want to be healed, we're encouraging you to conceive and have your own child rather than go and adopt somebody else's. We want you to learn how to give birth. Every one of you was intended. There's no infertile Christians. There's a lot of Christians that don't have any children that haven't given birth to anything, but it's not because God didn't equip you to do it. You just haven't learned how to receive it and how to do it. And that's what the, all of this is about. And you conceive these miracles in your imagination. Amen. There is a proper use of your imagination. And you know, once you understand this, it's kind of like having a physical child. The conception's the best part, amen. <laughs> Sometimes giving birth is a little painful, but man, the conception, that's fun. <laughs> and I've actually gotten to where I enjoy conceiving things more than I do giving birth to it. When we built our first building down in Colorado Springs, uh, debt-free, $3.2 million down there, man, it was the biggest miracle that I had ever seen. At that time, at the uh, income level that we were at, it would have taken me till I was 120 to have accumulated that $3.2 million. And so to get $3.2 million in 14 months and move into that building was a greater miracle than to what you see here, proportional to our income. And so it was a big deal. And man, I was, I put tape down on the floor. I had our builders take the plans and put where the walls were, where every door was. They would take the, um, what do you call that, duct tape and they would move it so I could tell it was a door. And I would spend it probably three hours a day in the dark walking around that building after everybody was gone. And I'd pray over everything. And I was looking at all of this. I'd see this tape on the floor and say, is this the way I want this to look? Some of you don't have a very vivid imagination to think this is crazy, but man, I would, I'd walk and I never stepped through a wall. I never stepped over the tape. I would go to where the door was and I'd see myself opening that door and I'd walk in. And when in our auditorium, I put four or five gallon buckets down and I put sheetrock on top of it and I stood up there like a stage and I stood there and I preached entire messages with nobody there. It was totally dark and I preached. And again, I know some of you think, boy, you're weird. <laughs> well, I think you're weird. Look what my weirdness <laughs> has produced. <laughs> but there was just no way in the natural for this to happen. But you know what? I saw it. I don't know how to describe this to you. If you have allowed the devil to just quench your imagination, to put out your imagination, some of you may just think that this is totally strange. But I'm telling you, once I see something, I've got it. And I know I've got it. Whether I can see anything or not, I've got $150 million worth minimum of buildings that I've seen. And they aren't, they aren't totally clear yet. Like these buildings, I started off and 
I knew that God was wanting me to build some things, but I just prayed about it. I meditated on it. I sat down with these architects and finally I saw that building over there with those beams in it. Each one of those beams is 90,000 pounds, 45 tons apiece. They're the largest beams in Colorado and one person told me in the U.S., but I, I can't imagine that that's true. <laughs> but anyway, they're, they're gigantic beams and we could have built things cheaper, but that's what I saw. And I said, this is what I want. And God told me to quit limiting him by my small thinking. And so I just sat down and we went through all of this process and we actually had the plans drawn. I had spent over a million and a half dollars on plans alone before I asked them. I said, how much is this going to cost? I never considered cost. I said, here's what I want. This is what God showed me. And I just began to dream. And at first it was foggy, but after a while I saw that building. And once I see it, I've got it. As, as long as it's vague, you might be able to talk me out of it or make me change. But once I see something, it's mine. I saw this building. I saw this building when there was nothing here. Did you know seven years ago on this date, there was zero on this property. Nothing existed. All of this has been built debt-free in seven years. And it's because, because I took the limits off and I began to start using my imagination. And I'm telling you that every one of you have that same supernatural potential. You need to loose your imagination and you need to see yourself healed. You need to see yourself doing what God called you to do. And if you can ever see it on the inside, you'll see it on the outside. It's really that simple. But most of us have spent a lifetime having our imagination squelched and it may take time for you to sit there and revive it and to get to where you start functioning in this. But man, it's well worth the effort. I tell you, this will change your life. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to ask Tracy to come back up and make the rest of the announcements. We'll be praying for you tonight. We're going to, I told one lady this morning, we're going to pray for you so much until we rub all the hair off the top of your head. <laughs> but I tell you what, if you receive these truths, it'll change your life. Amen. So this is Tracy Asia. She is a blessing. Awesome. Amen. God bless you. Amen.